Hello, and welcome back adventurers. Sit back, get comfy, and let us continue our exploration of this domain and its culture. Novavasans are rough, ragged people, well suited for the plains. All men, noble or poor, grow long moustaches and use wax to shape them into stiff and sometimes elaborate curls. A Novavasan proverb holds that a man without a moustache is like a horse without a tail. Given the pride they take in their moustaches, it should come as no surprise that men who wish to humiliate an enemy or a rival will seek to cut his moustache short or shave it altogether. Novavasan clothing, predictably, varies greatly between the social classes. Komnat clothing is drab, practical and of poor quality. The clothing of the poor is never dyed and predominantly dirty white or light brown. In contrast, aristocratic vestments are brightly colored and cared for meticulously. Men wear ostentatious riding breeches that flare from waist to knee and tie from knee to ankle. They also don thick, finely tailored coats over shirts of thin cotton or imported silk. Particularly wealthy noblemen wear garments trimmed in plain cat fur and necklaces made from the cat's teeth and claws. Noble women wear velvet riding skirts, billowing blouses and black boots. They favor long, thin scarves trimmed with bells and coins. Gold bracelets and earrings are the most popular pieces of jewelry among the women. Novavasans are strictly divided along economic lines. The wealthy aristocracy holds all the power, while the impoverished peasantry provide labor. One might look to the Church of the Lawgiver as the third pillar of Novavasan society, but the clergy are all aristocrats, and the actions and teaching of the Church serve primarily to support the interest of the nobles. So, instead of forming the third pillar, the church instead serves as a foundation of the first. An odd duality seems to exist in the minds of Novavasans, expressed in many aspects of their culture and daily habits. The aristocrats, for instance, speak reverently about the responsibility of a noble to his people and a master to his servants, and the importance of personal honor and chivalry. The commoners talk of duty to one's superiors, the sanctity of law and order, and the primacy of their community. In both cases, this appear to be sincere, deeply held beliefs. Yet, Namavasa is a land where the aristocracy taxes the peasantry into abject poverty, beating and imprisoning those who cannot afford to pay. A noble has the legal right to strike a commoner for the crime of insolence, and few think twice about exercising it. Many in the peasantry, meanwhile, throw themselves into every vice with abandon, steal from their neighbors and stare daggers into the back of every aristocrat who passes by. In short, a wide gulf stretches between the professed values of Novavasans and the lives they actually lead. Regardless, the truth remains that life in Novavasa is grim, hard and ugly. In the fields and farmlands of the noble families, the lords do as they see fit, with little chance of reclamation or retaliation. Fortunate peasants serve under lords such as Sir Tristan Hiregard, who is merely as severe as the law requires, but most lords are not as restrained. The average family labors hard from dawn to dusk for fear of not meeting the noble's exuberant demands, and then returns home at night to nurse their resentments in sullen silence. They do whatever they can to avoid the attention of the aristocrats and their guards, even if that means doing nearly nothing at all outside of work. Those who do feel secure enough to seek diversions play games such as horseshoes, ropes keeping, top spinning and draughts. Devotions to the lawgiver are a daily observation, often done in spirit of avoiding consequence rather than genuine reverence. Thus, in the cities, Vice has been crowned prince and he rules with trembling fist in a wine-stained glove. By the day, the peasants eke out a living however they can, be it via parity crafts, unskilled manual labor, or the provision of cheap services. At night, they spend their earnings in a whirlwind of self-gratification. Gambling is by far the vice of choice, with bets placed on games of skill and chance, races of horses or dogs, or caged combats between beasts or even men. The consumption of alcohol and narcotics is not far behind popularity. Opium from Haslan is particularly valid commodity. Amidst the storm of iniquity, violent crime flourishes. The aristocrats, living in luxury's lap and almost entirely free from legal restrictions, live largely as they please. Their lifestyles are paid for by the labors of the commoners, and while this arrangement frees them from responsibilities, it also leads to a fair amount of boredom and restlessness. A few loose traditions are in place to give young aristocrats some direction, but their adherence is as common as their defiance. One thing all aristocrats are expected to master, regardless of sex or birth order, is horsemanship. 
All nobles own at least one horse, and often many more, and numerous sports and games are played on horseback. Races, hurdles, stilts, and even jousts and melees are common and the results heavily wagered upon. A middle class is slowly merging as shrewd traders, landowners, and criminals are able to gather enough wealth to elevate their status and exert influence over those in the peasantry. This middle class is currently small and thinly spread, however, and in the eyes of the aristocrats they are still peasants, only with larger tax revenues to provide. A few merchants are trying to remedy the situation, increasing their political power by forming guilds and trading companies, but their efforts have yet to effect any real change. Education in Novavasa ranges from informal to non-existent. Peasants are too concerned about teaching their children practical skills, such as farming or stoneworking, to spend time imparting more academic matters. Literacy among commoners is almost unknown. Aristocrats hire private tutors for their children or send them to study elsewhere. University actually stands in Kantora, but it is small and not particularly popular or well-regarded. The Church of the Lawgiver provides education to its clergy, teaching them how to read and write and other necessary skills, but otherwise focuses on theological teaching of dubious value. Novavasans have developed a deeply rooted distrust of arcane magic. Anecdotal evidence indicates that they were far more accepting of it in a distant past, but the Second Judgment changed that. The Church of the Lawgiver in Novavasa has banned the practice of arcane magic as blasphemy, claiming that its spread was one reason that Lawgiver handed down the judgment. Suspected practitioners are frequently imprisoned. Divine magic is accepted if, and only if, it flows from the Lawgiver. When the Church of the Lawgiver deigns to admit the existence of other gods, it places them in subordinate roles, labeling them as servants of the Lawgiver and essentially powerless in their own right. Therefore, according to the Church dogma, any cleric performing miracles in the name of a god other than the Lawgiver must be a liar and a heretic, drawing his magic from arcane or even demonic sources. At the heart of the Church's beliefs is an unwavering dedication to order and law, and to the rightness of the established order. The Church holds that an evil comes from mitery, or rebellion, a malevolent force that is often performed as an evil anti-god. Mitri is seen as a nihilistic that drives individuals to destroy the natural order in the name of self-interest and self-gratification. The Church considers rebellion against establishment authority a deadly sin. Only if the lawgiver's mandate is formally withdrawn can the regime be lawfully toppled. And of course, the Church claims the sole capacity to recognize when the mandate is withdrawn. Novavasans often refer to their realm as a kingdom. This is the legacy of the great conqueror King Hochplatz, whom the Church of the Lawgiver has elevated to a sainted status. Hochplatz is seen as the realm's eternal king under Lawgiver's mandate, with the princes being merely the realm's stewards in his material absence. By tradition, Hochplatz's authority as eternal king is recognized in a number of symbolic ways. The great Blackstone throne in the prince's palace has traditionally been left empty, with the prince sitting instead at the head chair of the council table. The Whip of Right and Rod of Might, the traditional symbols of Novavasan kingship, have likewise traditionally been left unused, except in rare ceremonial occasions. Rulership of Novavasa is traditionally rotated between the patriarchs of the five great families, in what is called the ordained cycle of stewardship. Taking the title Prince of Novavasa, the chosen patriarch rules for a term of five years, upon which the title is transferred to the next patriarch in line. Obviously, affairs of the state have stopped proceeding according to this plan. Ofmar has reigned as prince for 28 years and thereby became the first prince to maintain the title for a full cycle. Were the ordained cycle still being observed, power would rightfully be in Bolshing hands, but only until the end of this year, after which Riftov would traditionally assume power. As the year continues, renewed pressure is mounting from Riftov's insistence for Ofmar to step down and let the cycle resume, but Ofmar shows no signs of being moved to acquiesce. It appears that the current state of government will persist for the foreseeable future. Thank you so much for your time, patient listeners. Novavasan traditions are as righteous as they're deadly. Don't forget that if you're about to strike a nobleman. But for now, as always, be careful while crossing the mists.